Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the past couple of lectures of guitar amplification and effects, we've been looking at the long-tailed pair phase splitter. I'm going to assume that you've seen those lectures. If you haven't, keep watching anyway. It might be fun, but I would recommend going back and watching them and coming back to rewatch this. One thing that made the derivation we did a couple of lectures ago particularly complicated in terms of figuring out the small signal gain and the output impedance is that we dealt with the general case where these load resistors might be different. What I'm going to show you here is that if you luck out and have the case where these two resistors are the same, then there's a way of decomposing the input signal that lets our analysis be a lot more intuitive. So now instead of RL1 and RL2, I just have RL. Remember that RK prime let us set the grid to cathode bias voltage, and RG, our grid leak resistances, which are usually the same, are much, much bigger than RK prime and RT in practice. So as far as the small signal circuit goes, we don't really need to worry about RG. And of course, we're going to short out the capacitors for our current small signal analysis. So our upper rail voltage is now going to be AC ground. And recall our circuit simplifies to something like this. We've defined for convenience an RK, which is the series combination of RK prime and RT, so we further reduce the circuit to this. Now, the formulas we used in the last couple of lectures can be used here. Basically, RL1 in the previous lecture is now RL, and RL2 in the previous lecture is now RL. So all of those formulas apply. But those formulas are a bit of a handful. There's a way of decomposing these input signals in terms of their differential mode and their common mode signals that will allow us to apply some intuition to make the circuit easier to think about. So let's say that we will define a common mode input as the average of VI1 and VI2. And we're also going to define a differential mode input Usually people just say differential and not differential mode, but when they say common, they always say mode with a common, so I'm kind of sticking with that in terms of how I'm notating it. If you want, you could put an M after the D here. Anyway, so the differential mode signal is just the difference of the two input signals. So if I think about this for a second, I can see I can rewrite VI1 as my common mode signal plus my differential mode signal divided by two. Because if I take the VI1 here and divide it by two and then add it to this VI1 over two here, that gives me VI1. Whereas if I apply the same sort of logic to VI2, well, there's a minus sign here, so those cancel. And similarly, if I want VI2, I do the same thing except this time I subtract VID over two so the subtraction here cancels with the subtraction here, giving me VI2, and then the subtraction will let me cancel these terms here once I include this division by two. So by superposition, I can now think about analyzing the circuit in terms of how it reacts to just VCM, think about the gain in that case, and I could also think about how the circuit reacts to applying these differential signals here, where I have to remember there's a minus sign here, and think of what the gain associated with that is. And then I can find gain formulas for VI1 or VI2 by just summing the results of what I get for those individual gains for the common mode gain or the differential mode gain. Let's think about the common mode input. This circuit is now perfectly symmetrical. So I could take this cathode resistance and rewrite it as a parallel combination of twice that original resistance. And because of the symmetry of the circuit, these things need to match up. Whatever current is flowing through here will need to match up whatever current is flowing through here if I write the circuit like this. So I can really treat these halves of the circuit separately. And so I can really just say, take this circuit here and analyze it. And if I do that, well, this is just a common cathode amplifier. So you can go back and find the lecture I did on the common cathode small signal analysis. 
and find the formula for the gain as being mu times r load resistance over the sum of the series resistances consisting of RL, RP, and in this case 2RK. But because 2RK is on the other side of the triode, our Thevenin equivalent research showed that I need to multiply this by mu plus 1. And because this is an inverting configuration, I have to be sure to remember the minus sign here. Okay, so what about the differential input? Well, whatever voltage is at this node here, this cathode is seeing it, and this cathode is also seeing it. So if I think about the currents here, whatever current is flowing out of the cathode here needs to actually be the opposite of whatever current is flowing out of the cathode here as far as the small signal model goes. So you could really say, okay, if there's a current flowing this direction, if I want to keep the sign on the current quantity the same, I sort of have an arrow going like this. Or depending on how you want to draw it, you could say it's going this way. Anyway, once I realize that the currents here have to match, I realize there's no current flowing through RK. So if there's no current flowing through RK, there's no voltage dropping across RK. So it's almost as if RK isn't in the circuit at all because of the way this circuit happens to be balanced with the plus over here and the minus over here. So I essentially have another common cathode configuration but this is even easier. I could imagine rewriting the circuit so I have a ground over here and I have a ground over here and these are now completely separate things that I can analyze. So just looking at the circuit on the left here, we now have an even easier common cathode configuration. So this is the bypass cathode case where you just have RL over RL plus RP times mu with the minus sign for the inversion. The one thing I want to be careful here with is that there is a 2 sitting here with the VID, so I need to put the 2 in here. Now, if I was a more dedicated professor, I would work out an example from scratch for an amplifier that uses a phase inverter of a long-tailed pair where the load resistances are the same, but my Fractal Audio FM3 just arrived, and I really want to have time to experiment with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pretend that there is a Mesa Boogie Dural Rectifier version released at some point where the load resistors were the average of the original load resistors. So if you recall, the one that we looked at, the actual real Mesa Boogie amplifier, I should say, has 82K here, and it had 90K over here. So I'm just going to assume that these are both 86, and that way I can use the plate resistance we computed in the last lecture, yada, yada, yada. Anyway, let's imagine this amplifier exists. There is a total cathode resistance here of 15.17K. That's from the previous lecture. And if we plug in these numbers into our formulas, we wind up with a common mode gain of minus 2.68 something and a differential gain of minus 30.28. So our differential mode gain is a lot bigger than our common mode gain, which is what we want. Now, when I'm computing these, I like to leave mu separate and apply it at the last minute. That gives me a sense of what this ratio is doing. Similarly over here, I like to take mu divided by two and leave it out here for a moment to get a sense of what this ratio is doing. The ratio of the differential mode gain to the common mode gain is called the common mode rejection ratio. And in case you have a situation where there's some weirdnesses with the signs, people like to put absolute value bars around this. So in our particular case, we wind up with a common mode rejection ratio of 11.29. This is usually reported in terms of decibels, in terms of power. So you could take this, take log base 10, and multiply it by 20. Let's see, it's 11.29 something, so log base 10 of this is going to be pretty close to 1. So you can multiply that by 20. So this has a CMMR of a little bit more than 20 dB. If this was the input stage of a operational amplifier, that would be considered pretty terrible. But it's part of the guts of a guitar amp, so yeah. Anyway, from the point of view of the user, i.e. us, 
we don't really think about common mode and differential mode inputs. We're giving it a VI1 from our preamp and a VI2 if we're using feedback, which I'll talk about in a later lecture. What we really want is to figure out how to get the gain formulas associated with these individual inputs in terms of the gain formulas we just computed for these common mode and differential mode inputs. Now I can invoke the power of superposition. So we've been computing everything associated with the output on the left. And in general, I can say that it's the common mode input times the common mode gain plus the differential mode input times the differential mode gain. Now, if I substitute in the expressions for the common mode and differential mode gain in terms of the actual inputs one and two, I get something that looks like this. Now, what about the other output? What about the output on the right? Well, all I really need to do is switch the sign on the second term because of the sort of anti-symmetry associated with the differential mode input. And remember that the common mode input was perfectly symmetric, so I leave that alone. Anyway, if I plug in inputs one and two into this expression, I get something like this. And now I remember that as far as what we were worrying about last time, I wasn't really putting anything into VI2. That's an input that you can use for negative feedback. We'll look at that later in the class. For now, we'll just use VI1 as the output of our preamp. So. Now if I simplify the expression accordingly, getting rid of VI2, I can factor out this VI1. And now I can see what the gains are in terms of the original inputs and our outputs. I can say that the gain going from input one to output one is the common mode gain divided by two plus the differential mode gain. And the gain going to the output on the right is the same thing, except now I subtract the differential mode gain. So if I plug in the numbers I computed for the common mode and differential mode gains for our hypothetical Mesa boogie, I wind up with a gain on the left of minus 31.54 and a gain on the right output of 28.93. So you'll see that these are both close to 30, which is what we computed for the case of the actual Mesa boogie with the differing load resistors, but they are different. Now I should be able to take the formulas from a couple of lectures ago and plug in the parameters we're assuming here and get these same numbers. So that's a sanity check on our calculations here. So all I did is I took one of the slides from the previous lecture, I just pasted it in here, and I changed the load resistance to 86 instead of either 82 or 90. So when I did that, I wound up with a gain for the left output of minus 31.6, which is pretty close to what we just computed using our differential slash common combination analysis. And as far as the output on the right goes, I computed a gain of 28.9 something. So everything matches up. Anyway, here's a homework problem that I'm going to assign to my Georgia Tech students. If you're not one of my Georgia Tech students, you might want to try this anyway for fun. So here's the formula we computed a couple of lectures ago for the output on the left in terms of the inputs at the input terminals. Now, if you set VI1 and VI2 equal to VCM, you should then be able to derive this formula for the common mode gain. Similarly, if you set VI1 equal to VD divided by two, I made a big mistake by trying to write this with a mouse, and then set VI2 equal to VD divided by two, except with a minus sign in front of it, you should be able to slog through the algebra on this and derive our differential gain formula. So that's the last problem on the next homework for my Georgia Tech students. Oh, just so I have everything on one slide, I should also include what RKI is. And actually, I think I was getting lazy. I think I might have called this RKIN before, and I just got bored, I guess, and stopped writing the N. Anyway, this has everything you need on one slide. 
So in either of these tasks, figuring out what ACM is or figuring out what AD is, the thing you should do is take RKI, plug it in here, and then explicitly write out this parallel combination. And then you'll find that this mu plus one will cancel a mu plus one that appears from that parallel combination. From there, there are several approaches. I'm not sure what's the best. All of them are pretty painful.